Okay, what we learned this morning was that there is an unprecedented time ahead of us, that the Bible talks about a time of trouble like has never been or never will be again, and that what, um, hang on, I'm sorry, I switched. Uh, there's two times of trouble. One's called the Jacob's time of trouble. That's the real bad one. And that's when you'll flee. You won't even get your coat. And your bread and water will be sure. And you'll completely depend on God. You won't be able to do any sustaining of anything because it'll be so bad. Then there's the little time of trouble that's somewhere between where we are now and then. Specifically, the National Sunday Law starts it and the death decree ends it. And during that time, we have the mark of the beast, 666, uh, not be able to buy or sell, and a time that you'll need to be able to go on with life and do ministries and things when you can't buy or sell. So that's part of the uh, uh, things we're going to talk about during our time together in this seminar series. Today we're talking about the practical applications, the urban dangers, and the end of life as we know it. Life as we know it will change. There's danger signs all over the place. And we're going to delve into how preppers, people in the world who are afraid of the end of the world and have good reason to be, are preparing. And how Christians prepare and how different they are. Uh, we have actually three resources uh, to help us with this study from the Bible. And that is last day events, which we used this in our session one. We also have the country living book. It's only about 32 pages long, but it's very powerful. And uh, the little book ministry to the cities, which is particularly important to this congregation, being as you are Phoenix Central Church. So this should be a, a book that you would all want to look at because it tells you how to minister to the cities. It provides explanations of gospel outreach in the cities. Now, um, you can get these books at the AdventistBookCenter.com. You can buy them at Amazon.com. You can get them in Kindle from, uh, on ebook readers from Amazon. You can get them in ebooks from Books.Google.com. Or you can get them free online or on your smartphone at EllenWhiteEstates.org. So there are lots of avenues to get these resources, including free. <coughs> Um, I'm going to show you some, a lot of media in this particular presentation and um, I'll try to identify where they're coming from. This particular one is a, a movie called Urban Danger. It is uh, a movie that was produced by some Adventist folks and done a very professional job of it. So here's an excerpt from that. Is, is the... Uh, Looks like it froze. Let me back up. Do you have the volume? I pushed the jack in, but... There you go. Turn it up and I can turn it down here. Oops, hit the, sorry, wrong button. I thought that was a volume control, but apparently it's not. Okay, so here we go again. Turn it up more. There you go. The people were eating out of the garbage cans, sleeping on the street, any place that they could sleep. They had a blanket they could spread in the bus station, train station. They would spread it in a corner, any place they could see the bus station. That's where they would spend the night. With no money. I'd heard this commotion out in the hallway one time, and uh, it was winter. And this family was being evicted out of the building. Uh, they had two children, and we used to play with the kids, and uh, they were the same age. And I went downstairs with my cousin, and uh, here was all their furniture out on the sidewalk, right on the edge of the street, not on the street, but right on the curb, where people could still walk by. But there, I remember seeing their dressers and their uh, couch and different pieces of furniture. 
and the two kids were sitting up on top of one of the dressers and it was snowing and I said my mom came down and I said mom what's going on and she said well they're they couldn't pay the rent you know they're they got evicted we uh, suffered a little bit in a depression for lack of food food was scarce our uh, the four uh, adults weren't working. My mom found a job uh, working in a hot dog stand, and she was able to bring uh, some of the buns home, and once in a while, some of the hot dogs. But my uncle uh, did menial labor now and then, and he uh, was able to bring home some food. I can remember my uncle getting some of the older potatoes from the mark guy downstairs we got to know uh, and bringing them up and making a potato pancake for us and we were lucky to get an onion in it ground up but he would make a, a good potato pancake and uh, us cousins would sit on a towel on the center of the living room floor we didn't have much furniture and uh, that's what we had to eat for the whole day and you see you had to buy everything you everything you had to buy We are all probably familiar with these stories and images from the Great Depression, but it's an often forgotten fact that many of these heart-rending accounts have a common denominator. Location. I'm concerned about the safety in the cities. Is it safe? Very. Uh -huh. Very safe. I feel very safe must conclude that American cities are indeed in the crosshairs. What's the probability that a high-density urban metropolitan area could uh, be subjected to a catastrophic event? The uh, probability is high. I think you have to you know, live without fear. What's historic about today is that now we stand ready to support America at home. We saw what Katrina could do to us which is, of course, a cakewalk compared to what we're talking about. Where is the biggest and most effective target is cities? I think it feeds into our deepest psychological fears. Part of our training uh, for this mission was to work directly with elements like the uh, of FEMA, uh, FBI, uh, state uh, agencies. I don't think we are in the right universe yet in our ability handle the consequences. I think uh, we're much less prepared now than we were five years ago. A more densely populated area is at greater risk and therefore have greater consequences. We're, we're greatly challenged. We have to understand if we get beyond a one metropolitan area hit, we have exhausted the resources that we've built up. So probability is high. I think that the probability of martial law would be very real. If you can take care of your family, you have a potential of helping your neighbor. Short of that, you become part of the problem. If I woke up tomorrow and none of these things that are all around me today were there, what would I need so that, that I and my family and my friends would be okay? That's an excerpt of American Cities, The Coming Crisis video. The last gentleman of those government officials that were interviewed is a 20 term uh, congressman and uh, he's a Seventh-day Adventist and uh, he has just retired and so he's not doing that anymore and so he they, I saw an article online his name's Roscoe Bartlett if you want to look it up there's a there's an article online about him now and uh, he doesn't even look like the same guy he's got a big old beard he looks like an old mountain man but he lives completely off the grid and everything and it's a pretty cool story but he was a he was a senator for about 20 years. Um, this is the the chart that uh, we developed earlier uh, with some in added enhancements. Oops, I'm trying to do the volume here so I can get rid of that hum. I don't have a mute button, unfortunately. 
Oh, I know. I, I was doing the... All right, how do we do this? There we go. It keeps going. Sorry, it's the first time I've used this clicker and I'm not used to it. We're getting it. <laughs> Sorry about this. There we go. Okay, yeah, the volume's down here, not there. My mistake. Okay, uh, so this is the time chart, and I have, remind me when we're done, we're going to have people pass these out to you. And it's got on the bottom all the references, so you can look these up and study it for yourself. Matter of fact, if you want to, Raleen, have the kids pass them out, you can. And then keep an eye out for anybody that's new that's coming in. Uh, but there's two times of trouble we learned this morning. There's Jacob's times of trouble, which is the death decree. We flee to the mountains. Your bread and water will be sure. No more saving the lost because everybody's made their decision and we're totally dependent on God. A little time of trouble is the mark of the beast. You can't buy or sell. And that's a time when, if we're going to be able to function when you can't buy or sell, you'd want to have some way to sustain yourself because this isn't the time when your bread and water is sure and you're fleeing to the mountains. Uh, this is also the last attempts to reach the lost before probation closes for them. And once again, we have total dependence on God. Uh, this is, uh, we're going to see several video clips here that are showing you how people in the world are worried about the end of life as we know it. We, we know from Bible prophecy that there are uh, certain things that are going to happen that are pretty ominous, but these people don't know these things and they're still worried to death uh, They see what's happening in our country and around the world and and there are entire series of TV shows Dedicated to following these kind of people around and finding out what makes them tick and the first one I'm going to show you is in National Geographic. These are the California couple uh, That I think have some kind of profound things to say <laughs> California Sierra Nevada mountains. There is a secret that Suzanne Streisauer and her partner, Dave, have worked hard to conceal from the rest of humanity. After 15 years spent biding their time, they're almost ready to reveal the true purpose behind every hiding away up on the mountain all they need now is for the world to end when the economy collapses i'll barter everything i have to survive and thrive the united states is doing things that are very unsustainable for itself and there's such a polarization in our congress and and government that is breaking right before our eyes. So the United States is not gonna be the global standard for the currency anymore. I think we're gonna for sure have some kind of currency flex where money is not gonna be worth what it, it uh, used to be worth. And I think it's gonna get worse. I tell everybody, listen, you need to have a plan. You need to know what you're gonna do if something comes down. So it's about mindfulness, it's about preparation. It's not about fear. That's why I really advocate for people to be lifestyle preppers, not doomsday preppers. I thought that was pretty profound for a non-Christian. <clears throat> so many people are fearful of the end of the world as we know it, that there are a growing number of popular TV shows on how to get prepared, as they're called preppers. National Geographic has a show called Doomsday Prepper. Here's a sample of that. of the power grid. The Yellowstone supervolcano. A financial collapse. And protect themselves. And survival is the goal. It's into the spider hole. Fast, 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 fast. Go, 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 go. From what they perceive is the fast approaching end of the world as we know it. So what are you with? Like this. Ah, yeah. Next, we go inside the 
the lives of three committed preppers. You gotta hurry, hurry. Who've devised extensive plans. Let's grab these water tanks. And food. Gone to great lengths. Which one of you would like to be in radiation I'm gonna pass out, Bradford. And made huge personal sacrifices to ensure their very survival. In my mind, I think the world's kind of falling apart. And it's only gonna get worse. Uh, Discovery Channel has a show called Doomsday Bunkers. The end is near. In every corner of America, people believe our world is changing. The moment I saw the planes hit the towers, I really woke up. To them, civilization is falling apart. It's gonna be mayhem and hell. And the rest of us are in denial. They call themselves preppers, and they're getting ready for the apocalypse. No advanced salvation, disease, no medicine. I look forward to when Mother Nature gets back. That's great. They're piling up guns and food. But what they really need is the perfect place to lay low. Real low. Enter Scott Bales and Deep Earth Bunker. Basically, what's your fears? I have a sleeping giant right behind me. And the meltdown will take out this entire area. Comic glass. Everything goes quiet. You're gonna see dying people all over the place. But not me. I'm a prepper. My biggest fear is weather coming upon us and you're totally at the mercy of the storm. If you're not in a bunker, the chances of survival is going to be slim. People need to wake up. God forbid another huge disaster occurs. If it happens, they're done. What do you see wrong with that lady living across the river from the nuke site? By the time it's too late, she's not in the bunker yet. <laughs> she should move. <laughs> she thinks a gun's going to help? I don't think so. Um, Travel Channel has one called Doomsday on Wheels. Security consultant Jim Delossier is building vehicles aimed at protecting its occupants from real-world emergency situations. These monstrous machines feature high-tech filtration systems for water and air, energy cells, and even a state-of-the-art Faraday cage to shield electronics from an electromagnetic pulse. Everything you can need to survive a catastrophic event is contained in one of Jim's menacing survivor trucks. His idea was to create the ultimate survivalist driving machine, something that could maintain and function through any type of cataclysmic event. That's what you need in your backyard. And then National Geographic had an episode with this gentleman who bought this, who started to build this castle during Y2K fears, and then Y2K didn't happen, so he quit. And about 12 or 13 years later, he's worried again, and so he started to work on the castle and they did an episode, these are weekly things, on him and now it's spun into a whole show. So here's uh, Doomsday Castle. I am a prepper. I believe the end times are near and few will survive the chaos. I called on my children to help me finish my life's work a massive fortress to protect us. I will do whatever it takes to ready my family for the coming dark ages and complete our doomsday castle. It's almost funny, isn't it? <laughs> Luke 21 says, Men hearts failing them for fear and looking after the things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven and earth shall be shaken. It's no surprise that these people are afraid of the future. Now, let's analyze. I went through uh, at the beginning of these doomsday prepper shows. I happen to like watching them, and I have to sift through all the guns and the junk to get to little tidbits of things I can learn that are useful. But every time they start an episode, 
they tell what the people are afraid of, and it's usually different stuff. So I went through and off their website, and I made a list of things that people are afraid of and why they prep. And we have economic collapse, massive earthquakes, rising ocean levels, super tsunami, catastrophic weather, global pandemic, a polar shift, that's the earth tilting further, sudden climate change, uh, solar flares, um, which are those big fireballs you saw go over Russia from the sun, super volcano, uh, that one in particular is Yellowstone. They believe that to be the biggest volcanic place and could be a super huge volcano. Hyperinflation, that's the dollar going crazy. Catastrophic oil crisis. EMP, we'll talk about what an EMP is later, but it's basically a, uh, a, a terrorist bomb over the United States that takes the grid out so we don't have any electricity nationwide. So the power grid goes down. Terrorist attack, nuclear accident or war. Civil unrest, any of these things happen, you're going to have civil unrest. Martial law will then be the result. The government will say, we've got to stop civil unrest. Now we're going to go into martial law, which means you don't have any rights anymore. The apocalypse, which is the Bible's prophecy of the end of the world, and the end of the world. So these are things that worldly people are worried about, specifically naming what they're worried about. Uh, and some of them, as you can see, the last couple are ones that we're also knowledgeable about. So this is a clip from the Urban Danger movie. Uh oh, hang on. Stop already. My mistake. I turned the volume down. But if you have the ability, uh, and you're in a very high threat area, and it becomes a point where when every time you drive across the bridge, into that metropolitan this area, this guy was a social director of FEMA. by a terrorist event. And it becomes a point where it is it is weighing on you, and that you do not believe that you can, even with due diligence, uh, develop a set of circumstances that will assure safety for your family. Maybe you should try to look at relocation. Christians have better reasons to prepare for the time of trouble than the worldly people. The Bible says in Psalms 9, He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God. In Him I will trust. Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, nor the arrow that flieth by day, nor for the pestilence that walketh in the, in the darkness, nor of the destruction that wasteth at noonday. A thousand shall fall at my, thy side, and ten thousand on thy right hand, and but it shall not come nigh thee. Psalms 9. 91. Did I have it right on the other slide? Okay. Thank you. Only with thine eye uh, shalt thou behold and see the reward of the wicked, because thou hast made the Lord which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. There shall no evil befall thee, neither shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over thee, and keep thee in all thy ways. Did you know that last phrase was part of all that? That's, that makes that promise all the more powerful, if you ask me. Uh, Rolene, would you rem remind me when we're done to, to change that to Psalms 91? said uh, Psalms 9. Thank you. And Revelation 12 says, And I heard a loud voice saying from heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accuses them before our God day and night. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of his testimony. And they loved not their lives unto death. Christians have better reasons to prepare and move from the cities into the country. This is a news clip from CBN News. We have a breaking news. Navy protesters are on the streets of Los Angeles right now. Alarm over the future of America can be seen almost daily in the headlines. The loss of privacy, constitutional freedoms, and out of control government spending are just a few of the reasons sending shockwaves across the country. Christian bakers in Oregon, religious persecution is on the rise. 
and that's leading many believers to look beyond the ballot box and start voting with their feet. He's Dave Westbrook moved now. his family out of the city 12 years ago. I was pastoring a city church, and it was through my own Bible study and my own prayer life that I became convicted that I needed to do something. We needed to live in a different situation. The area he chose is attracting more and more like-minded families every year, the Inland Pacific Northwest. It's an area which includes Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and the eastern parts of Washington and Oregon. Members call this movement the American Redoubt. Ultimately, we believe God led us to the Northwest. I think that people recognize tough times are coming, and it's causing them to think about their situation. It's causing them to think about how they live now, the security of their family, the stability of society, and how they're gonna to relate to that. But I'm finding something else too, and that is that more and more people are resonating with this idea of getting back to the land, of living a simple, more natural way. And I mean, that, shouldn't, that doesn't surprise me because the way I see it, the Creator wired us for this. Idaho is a paradise for nature lovers of all kinds, and it's also one of the least populous states in the Union. And that's a big draw for the kind of people that would come to the American Redoubt. Not necessarily because they want to get away from everybody, but just because they feel like it's more free for them to live and work and worship as they please. Where your kids can run free. Um, they're spending time with, you know, livestock, with the horses, they're in the garden. We saw how quickly things deteriorated. John and Sarah enjoyed life in Florida until a hurricane changed their outlook forever. They asked we not show their faces. How fragile our civilization is. And uh, I witnessed people get into fist fights over bags of ice. And I realized that uh, if things were to get worse in this country, uh, I need to be someplace safe out of the big city. The couple invested their life savings and recently moved to the American Redoubt. And so far, they're very happy with their choice. So right now I can say I'm excited about the new challenges and, and the new life that we're going to embrace, that we have embraced, that we were read, prepared and ready to face. What challenges are coming our way, I don't know, but I know that God brought us here and God's going to bring us through any troubles that we do have. Welcome, and thanks for listening to Radio Free Readout, the emerging safe haven and refuge for God-fearing, liberty-loving... The growth year has spawned radio programs, websites, and even its own silver coins. Todd Savage moved his real estate business from San Francisco and now helps people looking to make the move. The core of this movement is to help like-minded, conservative Christians move to the Redoubt area, eastern Washington, Idaho, Montana, and sometimes Wyoming. And it's, it's a wonderful place to be to educate your children and to have freedom. Since the re-election of President Obama, we've seen a huge increase in demand. But it's not about being exclusive. It's about liberty. The American Redoubt is meant for freedom-loving folks that are accepting of everyone, regardless of their religious preferences, their skin color, even though predominantly there are conservative Christians coming here of all races, colors, and creeds. And it's not just families. Businesses are moving in as well. One notable growth industry, gun and ammo manufacturers driven out of other states by restrictive gun legislation. There are now 180 in Idaho alone. But Dave Westbrook asserts the biggest draw is spiritual. But the environment is just so much more conducive. And I think particularly it's so much more conducive to our spiritual walk with God. And, you know, that's, for us, for my family, that's the number one reason why we did this, because it was a way of life. From Northern Idaho, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. This is those of you here that are show, showing me property in Montana, you're right in the middle of the ridout. <clears throat> Christians have better reasons to prepare. We, we have the little book, Country Living, that talks all about that. And here are some excerpts from there. Instead of the crowded city, some seek retirement. Seek some retired situation where your children will be, as far as possible, shielded from temptation, and there train and educate them for usefulness. The more nearly we come into harmony with God's original plan, the more favorable will be our position in searching health of body mind and soul so 
the, the key elements of this statement are for shielding the children from temptation, training the children for usefulness, and having a healthy mind, body, and soul. Another statement says, again and again, the Lord has instructed our people to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions. For in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. Now notice the connection. This is talking about the little time of trouble. That's why we're counseled to move out into the country because of not being able to buy and sell. That's the connection. By the way, I want to I want to reiterate what I said earlier that I don't want to come across like there's only one way to do this or I know the answers. Uh, we're early in on this journey ourselves as a family. And every one of us here are in different stages in our walk with the Lord and different stages of, of this idea of positioning yourself to be better prepared for times ahead. So don't, don't look at your situation and say, well, this is impossible, I couldn't possibly. The Lord can provide un amazing things and the main thing is we need to be spiritually connected and depending on Him and then open to His leading and have the faith to follow. Um, again and again the Lord instructed our people to take their families away from the cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions. Notice one of the reasons is, is to raise provisions, to be able to grow your own food because if you can't buy or sell then you're going to need to be able to sustain yourself. So that statement talks about being able to raise provisions and that we won't be able to buy or sell during this time, the little time of trouble. Page 11 says, Ere long there will be such strife and confusion in the cities that those who wish to leave them will not be able to. We must be preparing for these issues. There's two things here. Why is it difficult? Because there's strife and confusion in the cities. Now, remember the scenario, what if something about life as we know it changes. Let's just take one example of one of those big double lists that the preppers, remember I had that list of the preppers' concerns? Let's say the grid goes down. There's an EMP attack, takes out the grid. Uh, you will see later in our presentation that uh, that United States Senator that was, that's an Adventist was in charge of the US government's push to be ready for an EMP attack. That was his baby. He had a whole subcommittee just on that. Uh, anyway, he said that if, if an EMP attack came and wiped out the grid, that there's about a dozen or 13 major substations in the, in the grid system in the United States that everything goes through. And if the equipment went out on those, that we could be two years out getting the equipment because they're not made in the United States. Now, just think about that for a second. What happens if you don't have electricity for a week? You've been through that probably. You know, the summer you don't have air conditioning. Your food goes bad. You can't buy gas. You can't buy anything because the cash registers are all running on electricity. You can't get gas because they can't pump it out of the ground. Everything you do, at least if you live in my situation, everything I do depends on me being able to buy. And if electricity's down, I can't buy. So that's a very serious situ situation. And what happens when that happens or anything else happens, all of a sudden, there's a rush. Uh, we ran out of power uh, when we were building our last house. We were, we'd actually sold our house and we were camping in our Adventist school classroom, which we rented and piled our stuff in there. It was an unused room. And I was drawing house plans. And uh, they had a big storm and it knocked out power for five days and mud flowed over the freeway and we were trapped on this island of land and and we had no electricity for five days and you know we improvised I drew plans in the daylight because I couldn't see at night and we we had showers in the school but pretty soon there wasn't any there wasn't any hot water and pretty soon we couldn't drink the water because now it was bad water and I mean it doesn't take very long so my, as soon as that happened my wife ran to town which was on this island of trapped thing and went to the store to buy some peanut butter and bread and the shelves were bare. It didn't take long. My wife went to Sprouts the other day and she went in the, uh, I don't know what time of day, midday, and she went to the produce section in the back. Almost everything was gone. 
And she says, what's going on? How come the shelves are bare? It was really eerie because we've been studying this kind of stuff and you know, trying to envision what this kind of thing would be like. And here these shelves are bare in Sprouts in Arizona. And they said, well, our truck's delayed. Everything that's on those shelves for produce comes in that day. And if that truck doesn't come that day, the shelves are empty. So now, what if you don't have electricity for two years? In a matter of three days, the shelves will be empty, or less. And as soon as that happens, what happened in the LA riots? Remember that in the past? People start looting, people start getting really crazy. Huh? Aggressive. Aggressive, yeah. And sometimes it's desperate because they are trying to help their family. Sometimes it's just mean. So being in a place where you're totally dependent and people going crazy is going to be in your front door is real serious. It's a good time to be out, secluded away, and be able to kind of live off your own property. Okay, so this statement says that the time will come because of strife and confusion uh, that those who wish to leave will be unable to. Now, how, how could it be that you couldn't leave if you lived here? Yeah. There you go. If there's no gas, then you can't get gas. And if you don't have enough gas in your car, you're not getting very far. My wife and I have started to think about having more gas, not do like I do and wait till I'm empty to buy gas. I don't want to waste time pumping. I'm going to wait till it's low. Now we don't do that anymore just because, you know. It's anyway, okay. So let's think of a couple scenarios of, of why it could be that you couldn't move. If you say, we were talking earlier, uh, you will see on this time chart, well, you've already got the time chart, right? If you look at the time chart on the left, you will notice that it has two times mentioned about leaving the city, right? I don't have the chart in front of me, but on the left it says a call to leave the city, right? And then when the National Sunday Law comes, at the bottom of that line it says the last chance to leave the city, right? Is that what it says on the chart? Last call. Okay, now, there are people who would say, yeah, but life's pretty good right now. I'm going to wait. Ellen White says that when the, when the National Sunday Law comes, then it's the last chance to get out of the city. I think I'm just going to wait. And it might be for justifiable reasons. They could say, but we have work to do here in the cities. We need to minister to the city. Amen? Amen. Amen. Okay. But if you wait till, the, just follow this thread. If you wait till the last minute to leave, you might not be able to leave, she said. Why? Let me give you some scenarios. Number, um, well, I'll just show you a scenario here. You know this sign. Remember how that went? Okay, let's say you own your house. You have some payments on it. And, and it, you get impressed. It's time to leave, and I've got to leave right now. Number one. Are you going to find a buyer? Well, God can miraculously find you a buyer. But think about this. I don't, I'm not saying this is true. But there, there is some indication that there will be slavery during the little time of trouble. How would there be slavery? What if you, you owed money on your house and now you can't buy or sell? That means you can't make a payment. Unlike the recession we just went through, where you could just say, well, fine, here's the keys, I'm leaving. They'd say, no, 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 you can't leave. You have a contract. I own you. You're going to work and pay this payment. That's my theory on slavery. Now, this is really interesting. I'm sure you haven't heard of this. This is Agenda 21. This is fairly new to me. Um, I'm not, a, I'm not a pastor, I'm a nobody, but, I, but I'm a teacher. See, no, teachers are nobody, right? Um, I teach sustainable construction for ITT Tech Online, among other things. This is the textbook. It's called Integrated Design for Sustainable Building. Now, sustainable building, in their definition for the most part, means let's do it good for the earth. Let's, not, let's recycle and let's use repurposed materials and stuff like that. That's, that's their definition of sustainable construction. But it also includes 
you know, alternative energy and stuff like that. Now, in this book, in this, in this textbook, it talks about the Agenda 21. Agenda 21 was the United Nations meeting in two, 1992 in Rio de Janeiro. It was called the Earth Summit. Have you heard that phrase before? Earth Summit. That sounds like a pretty good, ecologically good high road to take. Let's take care of Mother Earth. Let's not, let's not wipe out the Amazon uh, rainforests and all that kind of talk, okay? Global warming, all that stuff. It's, it made a declaration on environmental development and it was adopted by 178 countries, okay? This isn't just the United States. It isn't some special interest group. This is the global con major countries agreeing that we're going to do this plan, okay? Here's what some people say about this plan. Most Americans are unaware that one of the greatest threats to our freedom may be the United Nations program called Agenda 21. Another person says, smart growth plans usurp property rights. Clearly, smart growth plans, that's what this Agenda 21 is, will impact Americans' future choices in where and how they live. Most of the dwellings in these new urbanist neighborhoods. See, part of this plan is let's get everybody together, let's bring them into the cities, and let's build little communities where you can not have to use your car, where you can walk to work, you can walk to the store, you can do everything, uh, kind of a condo type environment. Most of the dwellings are within a five minute walk to the center. Transit stop is located at the center. These are all out of this textbook that I teach from. It preserves open space and farmland and natural beauty and critical environmental areas. So if the push from Agenda 21 is to squeeze everybody into the cities and to protect the farmlands and to protect the wetlands and protect the environmentally sensitive areas, what does that do to your ability to say, I want to go find myself a little piece of heaven out in the country? Guess what? It just got complicated because the, the big brother is trying to make it so you can't move out in the country. They want you to go the other way, okay? Just, just something to think about. What else could cause this? This one hit me personally, blindsided us big time. Uh, we have been looking for property for a couple of years. And uh, it's hard for me to be patient. I'm, I, I, when I'm ready to go, I wanna go now. And fortunately, my wife is a good balance, but we're all kind of getting impatient, you know, but we're waiting on the Lord. We, we pray every day that the Lord will open and close doors. And so we've been working on trying to get this particular piece of ground for over a year. And uh, to make a long story short, we could have bought it a year ago. And we were talking about making an offer on it. And then the very next day, another guy out of the blue made the same offer and it was accepted. So we thought, well, okay, there's a closed door. This was 120 acres that were one big piece that on the map showed three of them, but the county said, no, this is one piece. The three pieces are based on tax assessor's office, but on the building department side, it's one piece. It's out of the fire district, it's timberland. In order for you to build a house, you're gonna have to divide it. That's a lot of money, risky thing, maybe it won't work, and bring it in the fire district and so forth. Okay, so this guy buy, uh, offers to buy it, the offer's accepted, and we decide, well, you know, we heard rumor he was gonna build a cabin. He's a software engineer from Seattle. Maybe he's just gonna build a cabin. Maybe we can get acquainted with him. So we got to be friends with the neighbor. He's talking to the guy and feeds us, calls me and feeds us information so we learn what this guy's doing. Gets him the number, we call him, we have a chat. We've been dialoguing back and forth every month or so ever since. And a, and a year ago, after while he was still in the process of going to close this deal, um, made a verbal agreement with us that he wanted to go in and log the lower 40 acres. We wanted the upper two. And, uh, and, and then he would sell it to us. We had it all agreed to. And then his attorney got involved and it got real muddy. And our attorney got involved and it got real muddy. And we agreed to not agree. So we walked away from the table with the idea that, well, let's just wait till we're finished logging. Should be the middle of the summer. And then, then we'll talk and see if we can sell it anyway without all this red tape. Okay, fine. 
July comes, he hasn't even started logging yet. And you know what happened October 3? <laughs> Amazing. I never saw this coming whatsoever. An unforeseen situation happened that I never would have thought would have happened. The three Indian tribes in that county collectively sued the state of Washington, Department of Ecology, and won because of the impact on the, on the rivers. The water levels have been going down. The spawning, that river has, it's the only river in the state that has five kinds of salmon. And so they have a right to be concerned about this. And fishermen were involved, environmentalists are involved. Everybody's attacking the Department of Ecology. So this judge makes a judgment and says, you're right, boom, you can't drill a well. All of Skagit County, Skagit River Basin, you cannot drill a well, including the people who already drilled them in the last couple of years. They probably aren't going to be able to use their wells. It's that red part on the map. It's a whole county. Now, what if, what if we'd bought that land in January? Number one, we'd have to divide the land. He since found out it really was divided. The county records went back to 60s. He went back further, probably the surveyor, and found where it really was, three different people that owned it. Now you didn't have to do the land division. It's already certified 40 acre lots. This thing comes along. Now you can't drill a well. You can't get a building permit without a well. Now, I don't know what the Lord's got in mind, but I'll tell you what, I never saw this thing coming. It rains a lot in Western Washington. Who would have ever guessed the rivers would be low enough for that to happen? I mean, there's water everywhere. So, when we, when we think about that statement that says that you might not be able to leave when you want to, there could be reasons that we don't even anticipate why you couldn't move if you, if you don't when you are impressed to do something about it. And I'm not here to tell you to move. I'm just telling you what, what we're told. Okay, Country Living, page 11. Air long means in the future, soon, those who wish to leave them will not be able to. You must be preparing for these issues. Pretty ominous statement. So we have these problems with staying in the city, strife and confusion, hotbeds of iniquity, and unable to leave later on. Here's another, page 13. There's not one family in a hundred, this is talking about the children, not one family in a hundred will be improved physically, mentally, or spiritually by residing in the city. Send the children to schools located in the city where every phase of temptation is awaiting to attract and demoralize them and the work of character building is tenfold harder for both parents and children. Did you see the two math equations there? Not one in a hundred is going to benefit from raising your children in the city and if you do, it's going to be ten times harder to save them. It's pretty, pretty ominous. Some of us here are beyond the children's stage but if you're not, this is pretty serious. So we have two, two bullet points here. Not one in a hundred is better in the city and it's tenfold harder to save your children if you stay in the city. There are benefits to children if you're not in the city. Let parents understand that the training of their children is important work in the saving of souls. In country places, abundant, use, useful exercise will be found in those things that are needed to be done and which give physical health by developing nerve and muscle. Out of the cities is my message for the education of children. So we've got seeing the value of soul winning, abundant exercise, physical health, and education of children in the country. Page 14, it is Satan's purpose to attract men and women to the cities. Does that sink, sink that one in? It's Satan's purpose to get us to want to go to the cities to live and gain his object and to gain his object, he invents every kind of novelty and amusement, every kind of excitement. And the cities of earth today are becoming, as it were, the cities before the flood. Out of the cities, do not consider it a great deprivation that you must go into the hills and mountains, but seek for that retirement where you can be alone with God to learn his will and way. So here we've got these bullet points. Satan wants to attract people to the cities. Satan wants to offer amusement and excitement. He wants to make the cities more like before the flood. And he wants to distract us from God's will and his plan. Page 16, instead of dwelling where only the works of men are seen, where the sights and the sounds frequently suggest thoughts of evil, 
where turmoil and confusion bring weariness and disquiet disquietude. Go where you can look on the works of God. Find rest of spirit and the beauty and quietude and the peace of nature. Let the eye rest on the green fields and the groves and the hills. So we've got uh, the benefits of country living. Uh, we're being removed from the sights and sound of evil, avoiding noise and confusion, less stress, more rest, peace and quiet, the beauty of nature. Page 20 says, if, if in the providence of God we can s secure places away from the cities, the Lord would have us do this. There are troublous times before us. The time has come when as God opens the way, families should move out of the cities. More and more as time advances, our people will have to leave the cities. For years we have been instructed that our brothers and sisters, especially families with children, should plan to leave the cities as, they, as the way opens before them to do so. Many will have to labor earnestly to help open the way. Now notice that. This doesn't just happen and fall in your lap. God expects us to work at this kind of a major change. <clears throat> As God's commandment keeping people, we must leave the cities, as did Enoch. We must work the cities, but not dwell in them. So Enoch worked the cities by living out, out of town. Out of the cities, out of the cities, this is the message the Lord has given me. We must make wise plans to warn the cities. Now notice, we're not leaving the cities abandoned. That's not the message at all. It's, we're supposed to warn the cities and be a part of, of city ministry, but not necessarily where we live. We must make wise plans to warn the cities and at the same time live where we can shield our children and ourselves from the contaminating and demoralizing influence so prevalent in these places. The time is not far distant when, when like the early disciples, we should be forced to seek a refuge in do desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was a signal of flight for the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of the nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us, Sunday law. It will then be time to leave the large cities pre preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes and secluded places among the mountains. Oops. I think it's very clear from the Bible that there are going to be some very major things happening quite soon, I think, that will make it to quite to our advantage to be living in a country setting. So God's, God's preppers, the work of the people of God is to preserve, uh, prepare for the events of the future, says in Country Living, page 10. Testing, one, two, three, there we go. Oy. Okay, a little hot yet. There we go, is that better? Still a little hot. One, two, three, four. One, two, three. The work of the people of God is to prepare for the events of the future, which will soon come upon them with blinding force. Notice how quick it's going to change. Blinding force. Think of that EMP. Life as we know it, all of a sudden everything changes forever. It could be hundreds of different things that could do that. Not just an EMP, it could be all kinds of things that could happen. The dollar, the, a, a nuclear war, any of these things could happen. And all of a sudden, blinding force, our lives would change. If that happens, and I am in the scenario I'm in right now, I am helpless. I'm not... I'm not Standing here telling you I'm doing this right. I'm, I am not where I want to be at all. When any of these things happen, I'm, I am completely, not totally completely, but I'm not where I want to be. Page 11 says, we must be preparing for these issues. The work of God's people is to prepare for the events of the future. They'll come with blinding force. We were living on the Kitsap Peninsula that had basically two ways in and out. One was ferry boat, the other was a four-lane bridge. The Narrows Bridge would take you 
out of where we were at, but over it back into a city. And the only other way would be a ferry boat and a two-lane highway, Highway 3, out. It became very obvious to, to my wife and I that if there was a major disaster, uh, an earthquake or uh, perhaps uh, uh, a military attack. We were living in an area that had a nuclear sub-base that had a, a, a naval shipyard. We have the ferry boats, which was a really a lovely sight with the Olympic Mountains behind it. And then over the last few years, you know, you had the boats with the machine guns going by, which, which distracted from the beauty. We were kind of at ground zero for, for a, a potential attack, at least uh, a, a big uh, attack, realized that in, in about five minutes the ferry boats would be either filled to capacity or there'd be such mayhem at the ferry terminals that people wouldn't be getting on or off. And the same with the bridge too. In essence, we would be stuck where we were at. So that was kind of an issue for us is what would we do and how would they get food in if there was a, if there was a problem power would be down and in short order, we would just be helpless refugees. It just made sense to us to, to move to the country. Apparently the movie froze. So, the worldly preppers, this is interesting. Um, this is my own theory. Worldly preppers believe in evolution. The reason I say that is they believe in survival of the fittest. That's why they're packing guns. There's one guy on the Doomsday Prepper show. Uh, he said, I have enough guns and ammunition to kill everybody in the county 13 times. Isn't that sad? <laughs> why? Because they believe in survival of the fittest. And these people proudly say, when this whole thing comes down, nobody's going to take the food from my family. Nobody. I'll kill them first. They all say that. The only one I saw that didn't say that, there were two of them. One was a Mormon lady. I could tell by what she was doing. And somebody else who was a Christian. But most of them are packing guns and building explosives and all this stuff. And they'll kill anybody that takes their provisions. Now let's compare the Christian perspective. We believe in creation. We believe in an almighty God that created everything. Uh, we work hand in hand with God's providences. We trust Him. We're equipped not with guns, but the sword of the Spirit, which isn't an ar it isn't an, uh, a weapon of war. It's a, it's a weapon of words. And we like to help people. Now, in this very room, a year or two ago, I think it might have been a year, year and a half, Jerry Franklin came here. Jerry Franklin it does a ministry out of British Columbia. It's called You Can Survive. And uh, I found it very interesting to take in what he had to say. Um, and <clears throat> when he was done, he had a question and answer period, which we'll have when we're done here today. And somebody asked the question, okay, so now you've moved out in the country and you have this garden and you have all your provisions for your family and now the world falls apart and these people come on your property and say, uh, I need some food for my family. What are you going to do? And I have to be honest, I hadn't thought of that before. And he said, without batting an eye, we're going to give our food. And uh, that's a lot different than killing them. And, and I think of the, uh, well, it's, it's a future slide here, but we have biblical examples of why that's a good, a good way to do it. Uh, page 10 says, uh, or these are the benefits of preparing, to prepare for the events in the future. The work of the people of God is to prepare for the events of the future which will come in blinding force. I see the necessity of making haste to get all things ready for the crisis. In the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a serious one. We should now begin to heed the instructions given us over and over again, get out of the cities. When did it say to do it? Now. And that was a long time ago. We are not to locate ourselves where we will be forced to be in close relations with those that don't honor God. A crisis is soon coming in regard to the observance of, observance of Sunday. So notice, get out of the cities, 
because in the future there's going to be a problem with the Sabbath. It's not saying wait till there's a problem. It's saying do it now. So I don't know if I mentioned this or whether it was conversation, but let's, let's say you wait. How long does it take to get a garden to work? How long does it take to grow a, an orchard? How long does it take to learn how to can? I mean, how, do you, how long would it take to get your property set up so that you could survive a no buy, no sell situation? You can't just walk off and do it. It takes time. If in the providence of God, we can secure places away from the cities, the Lord would have us do this. There are troublous times before us. Too many of those living in the cities who have not a spot of green grass to set on their, up under their feet, uh, though uh, through nature they, they would hear his voice speaking to their hearts of his peace and love, the mind and soul of the body would respond to the healing, life-giving power. Psalms 46 says, Be still and know that I am God. So one of the benefits of being in a quiet place is to be near God. Now let's talk about city evangelism because I said earlier, this is not a call to abandon the cities, especially this particular congregation. 80% of the population in America is on 3% of the land. Do you realize that 100 years ago it was the other way around? Everybody lived out in the country. Everybody was self-sustaining. Everybody had a farm, a little hobby farm to be able to raise what they needed. And then when the Industrial Revolution came, people moved into the cities to be near their better jobs. So now the whole thing has flipped around and everybody lives in the city and very few live outside of the city. Page 30 says, as God's commandment keeping people, we must leave the cities as did Enoch, who, mu who we must work the cities but not dwell in them. Here's an excerpt out of the Country Living University materials. I'm just up here on a mountaintop looking down at our place in the country down that valley there. Did you know that the Bible predicts that a time would come when people would need to get out of the cities and move to the country? And did you know that time is now? Have you thought about how you're going to position your family to be prepared for what's coming? And did you know that country living is really the best way to do that? Did you know that a country lifestyle is the best way for anyone to get ahead financially in this economy? But I guess a better question is, do you know how to do that? Do you know how to make this shift from city living to a country lifestyle? What are the strategies? What are the steps to making that happen successfully? What are the most common pitfalls that most often cause people to fail in their quest of a country lifestyle? How do you find the best properties? Where are they? What's the fastest path to your country home? Well, it's those questions that I'm going to be answering in this free video series. You know, this is an unprecedented time to make this shift from a city lifestyle to country living. And you've probably heard about people who have done it, but how have they done it? How are they doing it? How are they making this work so that their family is able to enjoy a country lifestyle? You know, I look back on the time that we were living in a townhouse when the country living dream was born for us. That was more than 12 years ago. And you might be thinking, you know, country living sounds great, but how could it ever happen for me? I know that feeling. I know the frustration or even the overwhelm that you can feel when you think about, man, I'd like to do this, but how do I get over all the hurdles? I've tried this already and I've failed. Well, believe it or not, we've been there too. Our first attempt at a country lifestyle was a failure. We found ourselves back in the city trying to pick up the pieces. But we were determined, and out of that failure came discoveries that changed everything for us so that we ultimately did find our country home. And 
now we've not only been enjoying a country lifestyle for all these years, but even more rewarding, we've been privileged to share these concepts, strategies, and the steps that we learned with many other people to help them achieve their country lifestyle too. Dave Whitsbrook is the guy that was on that other clip with CBN News. He's an uh, Adventist pastor, and uh, now he's doing this full-time. And really great resources. Um, we'll talk about the resources later, but uh, great, great guy. Country Living, page 30 says, When iniquity abounds in a nation, there's always to be heard some voices uh, giving warning and instruction. As the voice of Lot was heard on Sodom, yet Lot could have preserved his family from many evils had he not made his home in the wicked, polluted city. All that Lot and his family did in Sodom could have been done by them, even if they lived in the country place some distance away from the city. Now just think about that for a second. If they had lived out in the country like Enoch did, uh, he probably wouldn't have had his wife turn into a pillar of salt and and I've often thought, you know, as as godly a person as Lot was, uh, you'll recall Adam talking about if there's just these many, will you not, you know? And, and and so Lot was considered a godly person. But think about it: when the angels went to Lot's house and knocked on the door to come in, what happened? Do you remember? The gangs were after them. They were going to rape the angels, and. The thing that blows me away is Lot had been perverted enough in his thinking living in the city. What did he do that he thought was the godly move to do? Give me a break. He offered his daughters to these gangs. I mean, how perverted and, you know, it's amazing. And yet, if he had lived out of the city, he probably would have not have made that kind of decision and he probably wouldn't have lost his wife. And, and, and you know that the story gets worse because the daughters ended up molesting him later and so forth. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a polluted story that if they had lived out without the evil influences of the environment they were in, they probably would have had a lot better life. Here's another portion of the Urban Danger movie. We bought property that is in a rural area. Uh, we built a home that is self-sustaining. Um, we can live offline if we have to. We have three different ways to heat our home, principally wood. We have backup power systems that allow us to run propane uh, furnaces, uh, thousand gallons of propane stored, with year's supply of food. Uh, we will look in the mirror at night and say our probability of our area being impacted through natural disasters, terrorist events, or whatever is extremely low. Uh, we can take care of ourselves and we are in a position where we can probably become part of a solution for our friends or neighbors. That's uh, something that does not happen overnight. Uh, you have to believe that there's a probability of, uh, of impact to your family. But it's nice living in a community where people are predominantly uh, self-sufficient and that are relatively independent and uh, when something goes wrong they don't go running to the government saying Where's the government and why aren't they solving my problems for them? When have you heard that before? <laughs> By the way, um, I'm, I'm a native of Washington State. I spend the winters in Arizona and Mesa. So I don't know the answer to this question and I'd like you to tell me. I know where the, where the targets would be, where I live at home. You know, the guy in the video is from my neck of the woods. I know with Kitsap Peninsula where he's talking about. There's a Fort Lewis. There's McCord Air Force Base. There's the tri tri Trident Nuclear, not Trident, uh, the the nuclear sub base, and there's a, a, a naval air station, all within Puget Sound, and maybe more that I don't know about. Tell me about Phoenix. Now I know the the helicopters are made in Mesa at the Boeing plant. The <laughs> no kidding. That's the one you see on the freeway off to the south, right? Nuclear power plant. Yeah, right. And which way is the wind going? They say 70% of Phoenix smog comes from L.A. Well, guess what? If that, if that nuke plant, which, by the way, where else would you get power from around here? You don't have hydroelectric, really, like we have in Washington. So that's probably a major thing for power. And if they want to knock out the ability to 
build helicopters, they could knock out that nuke site. Anything else you can think of what makes a target? Luke Air Force, Luke Air Force Base, absolutely. And that's, that's west of us, right? Okay, and then the Mesa Airport used to be an Air Force deal too. Uh, Williams Field, do they use that at all anymore? Yeah. Williams? So there's, a, there's still some military there. What else do we have? No kidding, and the biggest in Arizona. Yeah. <laughs> He's got a book. <laughs> you might want to look at that book. That's a really good book. Strategic relocation. It, it analyzes all of the places in the United States and what's, what are danger and what aren't from everything from weather to, to dangers and stuff. He starts with the world and goes through the country. Oh, does he really? He narrows down to the United States and goes through every state. Amazing. Very good. So we've got all those things that you named that would be reasons for targets and there are probably some we don't know. By the way, there's a... a the, at Tucson during the Cold War, did you know that the, is it Trident? Is that the name of the nuclear? I think it was Trident. Uh, I always get the name mixed up. But they had underground silos. Uh, I think there were 13 of them around the whole the valley where Tucson is. Can you imagine living in Tucson when there's 13 w nuclear warheads buried in the ground ready to go after Russia? When they did the, when they did the end of the Cold War, uh, I went on the tour. There's a tour of the only remaining one, and it's it's disabled, but you can go for a tour. And uh, they said that there is one left in Russia, and both of them are disabled, and both of them are museums that you can go down inside and see them. And the nuclear warhead on the top of this has a hole cut in it so that the Russians could look with their satellites uh, technology and tell that it didn't have a warhead in it. And it's open to this day, so anyway. Yeah, so even though we're out in the middle of nowhere, where this isn't L.A., it isn't Puget Sound, uh, we still have our share of reasons why there could be some uh, target areas here. Thank you for letting me know. Page 26, let everyone take time to consider carefully and not to be like the man in the parable who began to build and was not able to finish. Not a move should be made, but that movement and all that it protends are carefully considered and everything weighed. We have been planning and searching and researching for two years. As I said, I'm not very patient. That's a long time. I want to go. My sleeves are rolled up. Let's do this thing. But in God's time, he keeps holding back and, and we keep doing our part. And if we're not doing our part, then we're in trouble. But this, this t quote is saying, don't go out half-cocked and, and uh, rush, 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 and you don't have a clue what you're doing, and you end up getting into a big mess. And lots of people have done that. So this is, this is uh, the same person that says out of the cities right now is the one that's saying, but, take, but make sure that you do the right thing. And tell me this, how do, what's the best way to know it's the right thing in the right time? Pray. Absolutely, pray. Now, that doesn't mean you do like a friend of mine who's, who was out of work, sitting on his porch, and my brother went to visit him. And he said, how is the, work, the, the job hunt going? He says, well, I don't have a job still. And he says, well, what are you doing about it? And he says, well, I figure if the Lord ha you know, wants me to have the job, the guy will come up on my porch and tell me I'm going to offer you a job. <laughs> and my brother said, well, you know, you used to work for Napa. Why don't you go three blocks down and talk to the Napa store? And he did, and he got a job. So I think there's counsel here to be cautious, but there's also not an excuse to sit on our hands. That would be called what? Huh? Presumption. That's right. It's presumption if you don't do anything. <laughs> to every man was given his work according to his several abilities. Then let him not move hastily, but firmly, and yet humbly trusting in God. That is, says it all in a nutshell. There may be individuals who will make a rush to do something and enter into some business they know nothing about. This God does not require. Think candidly, prayerfully, studying the word with all carefulness and prayerfulness, with mind and heart, awake to hear the voice of God. 
This is another clip from the American Cities movie. We were looking for, for a parcel of property that was going to allow us to be able to grow our own, grow our own food, that was going to be able to afford us a uh, wood supply for heat, have water available for drinking as well as irrigation. And we were also looking for something that was going to be secluded. A number of acres we wanted. We wanted uh, 20, 40 acres. We wanted south-facing. We wanted water and we wanted trees. And um, the property we got wasn't even for sale when we found this piece of property. We were looking about 60 acres over and uh, came across this one. And, and um, we have a pond up above us. And, and, and we were looking for those kinds of things and, and quiet and not a lot of neighbors around. A place that was going to be quiet that would have natural beauty that was very important because uh, the Lord speaks to us through nature and uh, it's it just it was very important for us to have something that w made us feel uh, feel calm kind of uh, the, the serenity that one gets when just being being out in the uh, in the great out of door so how prepared are you you know how prepared I am I'm not. How prepared are you? We know this chart has everything that we've talked about, that the little time of trouble, which is before the close of probation, uh, has the mark of the beast, that we won't be able to buy or sell, that there would be value in be being sustainably independent because we won't be able to buy or sell. It'll be a time to help other people. It'll be our last attempt to reach the lost and be the need in both cases to be totally dependent on God. So that ends this session. Uh, we, we learned uh, that life as we know it will change, that there are danger signs of what's coming. And we saw how worldly people are prepping and we saw ways that God has instructed us to prepare. Uh, next Sabbath, if you're able to come, the topic will be, uh, no, that's what we already did, I'm sorry. Uh, the loud cry and warning the cities. So we're going to go into more depth about our responsibility to work with the cities in this uh, situation where we've gotten away from some of the hustle and bustle, but we're not too far away. I know of a friend of mine who moved to northern Idaho. There's a lot of people that seem to want to go that way. And he knows a guy who lives 50 miles off the pavement. Now, number one, that's way too far out for my liking. I'm 60, going to be 62 in about a week. And uh, I think I need to be nearer to a hospital than 50 miles off the pavement. But uh, I don't think that's following God's counsel to be 50 miles off the pavement. Because at the same time about that we need to move out of the cities, all the examples were, but work the cities. How can you work the cities if you're 50 miles off the pavement? Now, in today's, we're going to talk in another session about how far is far. How far should, could you be? But I'll, I'll just, well, we'll leave it for then. But we've got a little bit of clue about that. Put it this way, with our modern transportations, we can go farther than when Ellen White wrote about it and you were riding a horse, okay? Um, then the next week in the afternoon, we're going to go in depth on the practical side and talk about some of the things that people do to be independent from the system, independent from having to buy everything. And uh, we know from prophecy that's going to be pretty important. So we're going to just briefly go through some of the things that you can consider about that. I'd like to end again with these promises and a challenge. God is an ever-present help in times of trouble. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. And Romans says, let your heart let your hope make you glad. Be patient in time of trouble and never stop praying. And once again, during these times, God offers us peace and assurance and an opportunity to prepare for the troubled times soon to come. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the time we've been able to spend this morning and this afternoon and opening your word and, and getting additional insights from country living and, and ministry to the cities and and uh, last day events books. Thank you that some of these things are becoming more clear to us, uh, the times in which we live and the value of planning ahead 
and uh, considering these things seriously and try to position ourselves to be able to not only take care of ourselves and our families, but be able to be positioned to help other people during the difficult times. Because the difficult times that are coming are not just for us, but there's going to be difficulty for the whole world. And so it'll give us a golden opportunity to be helpful and show the love of Jesus. Thank you for being with us and, and helping our technology to work. In Jesus' name, amen.